This episode of Work Tapes is sponsored by Duke Timeless Spirits. Duke Spirits is blending modern technology and old school technique by aging their bourbons and ryes in the finest French oak wine barrels from 1932. And listen, I have some firsthand experience drinking their whiskey. It's sweet on the nose and the palate, but there's no burn going down. The spice, the cherry notes, the subtle citrus tones lingers really nice. Duke Spirits offers high-end, well-crafted bourbons, ryes, and tequilas. My favorite being the Extra and Yeho Tequila Founders Reserve. Go to dukespirits.com to learn more. And remember, kids, you got to be 21 to drink alcohol. Never compromise. Drink responsibly. Dukespirits.com. This is a podcast where we tear apart songs. Why was the song written? What's it about? What's the context and emotion behind it? Where were you at the time? What were you going through? How did certain lines come to you? What's the inspiration? How long did it take to write? I'm Brandon Carswell, and I'm fascinated with songwriting and how songs are built from the ground up. It's easy to hear a full production song on the radio and dismiss its origin story. I want to hear the rough draft of the song, or the work tapes. I want to explore the very beginning of how songs that move us and make us move are born. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Work Tapes. My name is Brandon, as usual. I am joined today by none other than Sam Outlaw. How's Hi. it going, Sam? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Thanks for coming. You brought me some um, gifts, some vinyl. Brought you some vinyl Two records. records mm-hmm. produced by our pal, Cheyenne Metters. Yep. And we were just talking about how great Cheyenne is. He's the best, man. He's... Um... He's a ridiculously talented musician, multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, producer, great songwriter, and a wonderful dude. Just a, a really good hang. So I feel it was a lucky day when I met Cheyenne Metters at the Grand Ole Opry. How long ago was that? Um, that was back in, I want to say 2019, I think mm-hmm. is when I met him. I um, I had recorded a a kind of a classic country style duet with this gal named Sarah Darling. Oh yeah. And, um, uh, I think I'd been, I'd heard his name because I was listening to some of her tunes on Spotify and I found this like EP that I was like, man, this sounds great. And I reached out to Sarah and I was like, Hey, who produced this EP? And she's like, um, Cheyenne Metters. And I was like, Oh, I hope I get to meet her. These are just beautiful tunes, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> she's like, well, you're going to get to meet him. Yeah. Uh, Cause he's going to be singing or he's going to be playing with us when we do our song at the Grand Ole Opry. So um, I got to sing with Sarah. I got to do the duet with her at the Opry and uh, we were backstage, you know, in the dressing rooms and I heard somebody talking to my wife about Enya. Yeah. And I kind of, per- right. I kind of perked up cause I love Enya. Like, yeah. full, you know, I'm full, obsessed with Enya. And um, so I was like, man, who's this cool dude getting yeah. down with Enya? And it, that was just the beginning of a beautiful relationship, you know? He's the best. He came and did an episode here. Yeah. Um, and we wrote together afterwards. And I was just, I mean, we didn't finish the song, but it, um, the hook is so fantastic. And he just, he just has this way about, I brought the idea in and he, he kind of like, 
moved it along, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like shaped it out and made it way better. And, um, I was telling you, I did a run with him to Florida recently and, um, the whole time he kept randomly breaking out his penny whistle yeah. flute. Yeah. To the point that like he's in the back while we're driving, playing it. And I thought it was like the radio or something. Right. He's so great at it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I caught a video one time of him doing the, uh, kind of that pretty little theme in the movie Titanic. Yes. And, um, cause obviously it has that kind of Celtic sound. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm always like, man, we got to incorporate the penny whistle into yeah. a recording at some point. It's great. So for y'all listening, just go back a couple of episodes and you can listen to Cheyenne's episode. It's pretty great. Yeah, Cheyenne Matters, what a talented yeah. dude. And again, for both these records, I brought you I brought you Popular Mechanics, which is my album that came out in November of 2021. Mm-hmm. That was produced by Cheyenne. And um, he co-wrote a few of the tunes with me. And then the brand new album, Terracotta, that came out um, this year, he also produced it and co-wrote some of the songs with me. And uh, and he's just playing all over these records, mm-hmm. you know, like, so yeah. he's he's the dude. They're great. He's great. Um, cool. Well, thank you for being here, by the way. Thanks for having me. I reached out to you because of Cheyenne, so, um, or he reached out on my behalf and we hooked up, so... And you were quick to say yes, and uh, so he's, I, he's our connection. Yeah, so I I I always appreciate when somebody wants to come on, uh, and they're pretty quick about it. I don't know why. I just I'm like, oh, they want to do that. That's cool. I mean, <laughs> for me, you know, the chance to chat with someone about music is, you know, that's a privilege. You know, yeah, for I don't sure. I don't want to miss out on that. So thanks yeah. for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, for our listeners, um, maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, who you are, where you came from. Mm-hmm kind of how you got into music just my whole life story let's start from birth okay just move on (laughs) so i'll make it i'll make it quick yeah i was born in south dakota uh which is a state in america in case that doesn't sound familiar um kind of grew up as a when in my younger childhood in the midwest but we moved to southern california when i turned 10 um so was mostly raised in like san diego and went to school in san luis obispo and ended up in la and orange county um kind of fell in love with like classic country in like 2004. I think I was homesick from my first like job after college and I caught like country music television doing like a countdown show of like best country songs or best country artists or something. And I got introduced to like George Jones and Amy Lou Harris and I was like, whoa, mm. you know, it really blew my mind. And so I feel like the next, you know, five or 10 years was just me diving deep into all things classic country. Um, and uh, in twenty in two thousand nine, I was uh, working in advertising, living in Long Beach, California, and kind of writing these tunes. And I think I was mostly just trying to kind of copy like what the Eagles did, which was kind of like take country music, country music, and mix it with soft rock. And right. you know, and so I uh, I put together a little country band in Long Beach and started playing out in two thousand nine. And because I had so my given name is Morgan, my name is Sam Morgan. Um, but my mother's maiden name is Outlaw. So, you know, half my family is That's Outlaw. her real last that's, name? That's her real last name. That's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I first started uh, putting together a band and playing out, because some of my advertising clients were like record labels and music people, I think I was kind of worried that like, I didn't, I kind of didn't want them to know I was playing music because I wanted them to just, I think I wanted like my work people to, to just see me as like, work Mm -hmm. i didn't want them to think i would like be trying to like you know i don't know snuggle up to them in hopes of getting a record deal right right so that was part of the reason um i wanted to use the name outlaw and also just the name outlaw is cool and it's like kind of catchy and you might you might remember sam outlaw a little easier than you remember sam morgan at least in terms of music especially so i started playing out and um would just uh kind of write songs at home play with who i could um, play weekend gigs in Long Beach and in Los Angeles for like two people. And um, in 2012, I, I threw like a show off birthday party for myself when I turned 30 years old. Okay. And um, came to from that sort of very hungover and just realizing like I've got, I've got like money, I've got a career, and I've got a lot to be thankful for, but I really care about music. And maybe music's not going to just drop on my lap. Maybe I might have to like actually work for it. So I started recording uh, an album 
in San Clemente, California called Nobody Loves, which was um, most of those tunes are what became the album I would go on to record with Ry Cooter, but got to make that record with a really talented guy named Kelly Winrich, who's in a band called Delta Spirit. Yeah. Um, but Kelly, kind of like Cheyenne, is like that guy who can just play everything, all-star producer, all-star engineer, all-star songwriter and vocalist. He can just do it all, you know? So made that album, put it out in January of 2013, and like, you know, it was just kind of crickets because I, I wasn't like connected in with the industry at all. I didn't mm -hmm. have a manager. I didn't have any nothing. And um, again, to make the life story a little more, com uh, I don't know, compressed, I um I just kept playing and then in 2014 recorded an EP it got kind of heard from some folks including Ed Helms at the Bluegrass Situation that helped me to kind of get like a last minute surprise spot at the Stagecoach Music Festival. Yeah. I was on my honeymoon actually and I my phone rings and I was like sweetie let me take this. Yeah. And they were like hey we had someone drop out of Stagecoach we want to give it the slot to you can you do it it's in like 3 days. So I flew home a day early from my honeymoon so I could play stagecoach. That, did that go over well? My wife was not stoked. She was not. <laughs> well, I mean, she was obviously happy for me to get sure, But yeah. like, yeah. I've, Timing I've, is off. Yeah. I've since made it up to her. You okay, know, I've yeah. since taken her back to Savannah, Georgia, which is where we had our honeymoon so that we get an extra day. But yeah, so got to do that. And then um, I started putting together um, kind of like a band for my what I wanted to be like my breakout album, trying to find a producer, couldn't figure out who it was. But um, I'd hired a guy named Joaquin Cooter to play drums. And um, we started rehearsing at my living room in Glacelle Park in L.A. And um, he asked if he could send the like rehearsal recordings to his dad, Ry Cooter. And I'd only met Ry Cooter one time, but it was like, well, why would this like legendary dude want to hear my little three minute pop songs? And what, you know, so um rye liked the songs and joaquin kind of came back to me and was like look if you're still looking for a producer you know me and rye could kind of co-produce the record together and that was an easy yes yeah. you know yeah. so i made that album with them and um that was really what kind of helped to launch my career what it, album was that it's called angelino okay. it, it was recorded in fall of 2014 it was released in 2015. okay but h hilariously i mean in many ways it's basically it's virtually just a re-recording of the album i'd put out in 2013 but obviously with rye cooter's name it helped me to get ears and eyeballs on yeah. on a career that no one else cared about you know two right. years before right um so yeah that was really what helped me to get you know like my first ever like tours and my first you know agent manager and that kind of stuff and um so yeah that was now crazily that was 10 years ago yeah crazy, 10 years ago but so she, that's and that's you me. started in california so what brought you back or brought you here yeah so um in 2018, it was actually New Year's Day. Um, my wife came down the stairs of our little apartment and was like, showed me the pregnancy test. Okay. And I was like, okay. And so we found out we were having a second kid. We we're going to have a second kid, which Magnus Morgan, my son, turns six today. So I want to give him a birthday shout out. So today is, should I, is it okay if I say what the date is? Yeah. September 18th is today. I don't know when you're going to put this It'll out, be next Friday. Cool. So, um, so yeah, we found out we were going to have a second kid and my wife and I had been kind of like window shopping homes in Nashville for like five years at that point. Yeah. And, um, we were like, okay, you know, I went from being in advertising, making a lot of money to being in music, making very little money, like basically just enough to like survive month to month. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, we could probably use a little more space. We could either stay in LA and desperately try to like, you know, put together enough dough to rent a bigger apartment mm -hmm. or we could probably afford to like buy a, a nice home in Nashville. You know, the, the cost of living, living is just that much better in Nashville, or at least it was back, it was. back yeah. then. I can't, I don't know if it is so much now. It's still gotta be a little better than California. I, I would imagine. So yeah. And all my family's still in San Diego. I'm, I'm back in California all the time. And, um, it's, it, it even more so now feels like a really lucky move that we got out to Nashville when we did, but yeah, so that was it. Really, the the decision to move to Nashville, obviously, the for most folks, it's hey, we're moving to Nashville because we want to try to make it in music or something to do with like kind of the the orbit of music in Nashville. For me, my career had kind of already kind of taken off being an LA based guy. So in in a lot of ways, I was technically kind of giving up a lot 
to move mm-hmm. to Nashville because I was known as like the LA country guy. Right. And then you moved to Nashville. Now you're just another guy. Right. Um, so the move was really to try to, um, I guess, build in some security and some comfort for my, for my growing family. Mm-hmm. And, um, that said, I mean, you know, since moving to Nashville, I feel so lucky that I've been, you know, I've got, I get to meet people like Cheyenne, mm-hmm. I get to meet people like you. I get to meet all the folks I've made records with. I've gotten to play the Grand Ole Opry a bunch. Um, I get to play Americana Fest, you know, th- that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's been um, a good move, but n- really 0% of the decision was music. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've had friends that move from Nashville to a- LA or something mm-hmm. for music. Sure depending on what the style is or whatever they're doing. But um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a different, different way to do it, but it, it seems like it did. It's still kind of morphed into what you wanted it to be. Right. Cause yeah. this is a music town. So it wasn't like, Hey, let's take our family to, I don't know, you know, some other place that's, that's a good point. Has no industry musically or whatever. Yeah. I don't want to make it sound like, None of the consideration was the fact that Nashville's still a music town. I think also Nashville checked off a lot of other boxes. Like there's a real airport here. We can, you know, I tour in Europe every year. So it was like, I can get to Europe Mm -hmm. in like one flight. Um, It's a real town with like amenities and, you know. And were you, uh, were you still working your, I say regular job, your other. I quit, I quit my advertising job in like March of 2015. 15. Okay. Um, after I'd recorded the album with Ry Cooter, but before I started touring on it. So okay. um I had been I had been kind of uh li- living as a full time touring musician for three years when we moved out to Nashville. So you didn't have to bring work with you, like that work at least. I did not. Okay. No, yeah. yeah. So that made it a little bit easier. I'm that sure. said, I mean, you know, as as I'm sure you know, Nashville, it's it's a great place to find a job. Like if for folks that are really wanting to be in any industry, mm-hmm. there's obviously music out here and there's healthcare, but Nashville has since become like a real magnet city for a lot of industries. So Yeah, I, I say it all the time. If you're looking to do music and that's what you want to do and you're not here just come here and get a job just get your normal yeah. nine to five whatever you're doing already yep bring it here and you will meet people in the industry hands down that's right yeah Have if fun. you i mean nashville is the town like you just show up and within yeah. 72 hours um if you kind of play your cards right you you really get to meet probably everyone that you really want to meet yeah you can't stay home but you can yeah you it's can not gonna meet, it's not yeah. gonna you know sneak into your living room and that's why they call it a 10-year town a lot of times mm-hmm. is after 10 years you're you might be where you want to be right musically or getting close or something yeah or figured out that you hate it (laughs) yeah um when did you start writing songs so when i was i can't remember if i was 15 or 16 i think it was 16 um my my friend ryan freeman was a guitar player and he taught me a couple chords okay and um i was learning to play like you know, semi charmed life by Third Eye Blind, mm-hmm. or I grew up in a Christian home. We had this Jars of Clay record that Which I really, one? the first record first I really one. liked. Yeah, with Flood. Flood, yeah. And I think I learned to play like you know you could go to the Christian bookstore and get like kind of like the guitar tab book. Yeah. Or you could go to Guitar Center and get those guitar tab books. So I think I learned like two or three chords from Ryan, and then it was like kind of off to the races. And my in my junior year English class. One of the assignments was to like, it was like a group assignment to like um, dissect or analyze a piece of poetry or something. And so we picked um, the Don McLean song, American Pie. Yeah. Because we thought, it would, I think it was supposed to be some creative element to how you presented the poem. And so we said, well, obviously songs are poetry in a sense. And so we picked that song. So I had to learn to play American Pie on an acoustic guitar. And that song's a great, like beginner guitar yeah. song because it's got like every chord yeah like g d e minor a minor a7 d and it changes D7. keys doesn't it no there's no key change doesn't okay. but there's a lot of like you know there's just a lot of those like oh like what's the difference between like an a major and an a7 and an a minor you know, you're talking about one note here and there yeah. 
So that was just a really good song for me. And you and it's it's kind of like a perfect folk song and it has way too many lyrics. It's just endless yes. verses and lyrics in that song. So I think learning that tune kind of launched me into first of all just knowing guitar chords and pretty much right away man I was coming up with my own chord changes and melodies to go with them. Yeah. So it happened between me learning to play a few chords on a guitar and me writing my own songs was like four days. Wow. And I still remember those first couple, you know, kind of horrible pop songs that I was writing about a girl. Yep. Um, but that's where you start, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, not, I'm not going to pretend I've uh, I've gotten much more advanced since then. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid. I don't know about that. I but, mean, did you start trying to play out immediately or was it something that overtook you or kind of developed with time or? Yeah. You know, I don't know what it, I, I don't, it's like chicken or egg. I don't know what happens. I right. don't know if I was trying for it, but there was this, um, I was in marching band and I played the trumpet. So all I did through. too, but did I you? wasn't in marching band. I was just okay. in like normal okay. sitting band. Concert band. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, sitting band. for me, marching band was like the ultimate experience. Cause you, I learned so much about, certainly music but how to be part of a team i learned about hard work i learned about discipline and leadership and all that it's like stuff most kids would learn in football yeah i was learning in marching band you know like at the halftime show but um so some of the marching band nerds had a band my buddy kevin wall and um two other guys anthony was playing saxophone um oh why am i blanking on my buddy's name that played drums anyway there was the they they already had this kind of like I th was it just a three piece? Maybe it was. I think so. They already had this kind of three piece band of like they would kind of do like more jazzier stuff because they were like really good musicians, right. like really good. And then they're like, "Well, do you want to do you want to sing?" And so I came in and I was just into like Oasis and Radiohead, like kind of the Brit pop wave that was mm -hmm. happening in like the mid to late nineties. And so um, we started out more or less just as like an Oasis cover band because I was like the songs I knew how to play on guitar. Yeah. But it, they, they had this weird kind of jazzy edge to them because we had like a saxophone player. And, um, and then I don't know how I had the gumption and the courage to say, oh, well, I actually I wrote a song. And so it was June, maybe junior, maybe even senior year where I started introducing to the band my original songs and we played them. Um, I think we got a chance to play at like the high school, um, what do you call it, like a relay race? There was like a stage and so they hired our band to play. And then one of my trumpet player's friends, dads, or like parents had a, um, like a New Year's party that we get to play at. So I started playing out, I think, I think it was my senior year. Yeah, also because I think we played at my sister's 15 or 16th birthday party. I think it was her 16th birthday party nice. at our house. So like that was huge. Those are all like very uh, transformative kind of gigs early on. Yeah. You know, when you play at church or you play at these gigs that now you think back to and you're like, man, if I had to play a birthday party right now like mm -hmm. that, I don't know if I would want to do it. Yeah. Or what it would be like, to, you know, like I remember I've played, I've played on a football field, on yep. the grass. I played on a tennis court. I yep. played – in a gym, I've played. I mean, you probably have also like when you're a teenager, you're just like whatever. Let's set up and play in somebody's house. I don't give a rip. Yeah, and like I don't remember. I think the other three guys in that band I had, they must have like had done it before because I th yeah I think the drummer and him and his dad knew a lot about music because I think they were the ones that were like this is called a monitor speaker and this is how you hear yourself and so because I, I don't remember learning that yeah. stuff but. I must have learned it. But it's right? so fun to be around when when you want to do that mm -hmm. early on yeah. when you're young. It's just so much um it's so much fun and nowadays it's easy to take for granted and lose that kind of magic. Yeah. You know, to a show or like You know, attitude is everything. Now man. I need I, in ears and I need all this fancy everything stuff. Everything has to be and, perfect. And yeah. that's fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm not knocking it, but there's something really special about the magic of just playing something live, just you and an acoustic or a band. It's the most special thing. And ever. there's nothing plugged in or whatever. It's mm -hmm. just like crappy mics mm -hmm. and you're just giving it your all. Yeah. And you're playing your songs way too fast because yes. you're so amped up on adrenaline. And um, yeah, man, you're right. Those, those early shows and those early experiences, there's nothing more special 
than just getting going. You just start. You you you're you're prepared to embarrass yourself perhaps, but you just start. And to me, there's nothing cooler in the whole world. Yeah. Than a young person just being like, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's do this. Do you think um, this is kind of a sidestep question? But do you think live shows right now are still as important or more important than like social media? Ooh, um, you know, I don't engage with social media that much. So I yeah. guess I would wishfully say I hope my live shows are more important. But, um, you know, I'm a 42 year old dad. Yeah. So I'm not like a super hot young person with a lot of like real, you know, catchy content. Um, I would imagine that for my fans, they're not looking to my social media for a big buzz. Right. Um, I would imagine, though, that if you're in a marketing meeting in a major label and because I've got I've got friends that are on like major labels and they will get they will get like a hundred to one um frequency feedback about their social media whereas very little feedback about their music and their live shows so if you're a marketing person at a major label the kind of machine you're trying to run is very dependent on social media Mm -hmm. um, content um which is just not something i care about i just can't i can't pretend to care like Mm -hmm. if someone said you know you got to start a tiktok channel i'll just say no i'm just i'm just I will never do it. I think that I think that live is still just as important. Yeah. Uh, as far as engagement goes, I mm-hmm. think your fans and and those that you find who they'll see you live and then they'll follow you. Yeah. That's that's, that's, that's the thought, the hope. Even you know, I know today we're going to be talking about recorded music, and it's like being in the studio and, and recording a song is such a different thing in a different mm-hmm. world than playing it live. I'm not trying to achieve the same thing live that I am and is recording and recording as I am live. And when it comes to my social media, I just can't fathom what someone, what are you thinking you're going to get from me? It's like, I want to post a photo of maybe my wife and my kids. Sure. Even when I release a song or an album and I have to spend time basically promoting that I've put out music or promoting that I have a show or a tour, it all feels like a lot of work. It you is. know, it, it's, it's not, and it's not like fun. Like music is a lot of work, but it's fun. Right. Social media for me is just like, surely there's something else I can be giving. It people. kills your soul. <laughs> or it's just kind of like, yeah, this feels like the day job part of it. Yes. I agree with that. I'm just interested in that right now. Cause I, I feel like social media is like a taking over and we all as artists, especially independents, we have to do it all. Yeah. And it's not fun. I, and I've thought about like hiring someone to help me out with that. And maybe that's, that would be a good idea. Um, but I guess I'm lucky that, you know, I'm, I'm a free agent. I mean, I have like, I have a little bit of a team, but like, I'm not beholden to a label. Right. I make whatever songs I want. I put them out how I want. I can distribute them instantly. I get to do what I want which means um, that I'm probably not going to get the eyeballs that someone would get who's connected to the big machine. But for me, what it means is that I just don't have to do that horrible nonsense. Yeah. And so um, I respect that it's, it's a benefit. And you know, if you, if you get lucky enough to win some lottery ticket where a bunch of people hear one of your songs or see you or whatever, um, that's great. And I, I, I'm, I usually, when I see people having big success, I wish I could say that I'm just like graciously happy for them. I'm usually like envious and, but the truth is I don't really work the way those people work. You know, they, they're working really hard. Like social media is work. Yes. And if you're good at that, like that's a big deal, man. I think that's Mm -hmm. cool. But I just, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me to try to pretend I care about that stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, Let's get into talking about the song. You want to? Yeah, I would love to. Um, the song we're going to talk about is on a record you made called Terracotta. Um, did you put this out? Oh, yeah, 2024. Yeah, it came out in March, I think. Cool. Mid- middle of March. And the song is called Someone Quite Like You. Um, I love this song. I think okay. it's great. Um, you sent me two songs to consider, Terracotta and Someone Quite Like You. And I kind of went back and forth for a day and I was like, man, I mean, it's kind of a toss up. I was only going to send you one. I was just going to send you someone quite like you. But okay. then I was like, you know what? It would be polite to give yeah. you a couple options. 
and I like the whole record. It's great. I listen to everything. Um, I listened to as much as your stuff this week as I could. And uh, honestly, my I think my, I'll just say this from the start, not tearing apart someone quite like you or tearing it down, but my favorite song is Pretty Good Singer. I love that song too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And it goes with this podcast really well because nice. it's about a songwriter, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I would encourage the listeners to check that it's out. It's the first track on the album. First so, track. Yeah. Um, I think it just caught me because it's pretty throwbacky. It and is like throwback country, and it's intentionally kind of tongue in cheek. Yes, yeah, it's so much fun. Um, but someone quite like you caught me because it instantly gave me these like, um, petty vibes. Oh you yeah, know, f- with the guitar, big yes. guitars, big wide open like, um, sound like there's some high strings in there, and mm-hmm. twelve string or whatever. Yep. Both. Um, I think both. Yeah. And that always gets me. And then towards the middle, and we can get into this as much as you want as far as production goes, but towards the middle, there's this um, saxophone solo that just kind of busts in. Shreds. Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> what is going on? And yeah. But it works and Dude, it's fun. Yeah. Um, so your music, uh, you have described as like SoCal country, right? Yeah. So Which, that Southern di- California. That, that distinction is like thirteen or twelve years old at this point. Yeah. I don't I don't know. I think now I'm just doing literally just pop rock. Right. But there's I, there is still country stuff in there and a lot of people pick that out still. Yeah, for I mean your your voice, um, I would say has a country vibe. Right. But I wouldn't necessarily pigeonhole it to that. Yeah. You know, like I feel like it's probably you could go a few different directions if you want to. Yeah. Uh uh, same with your like your style like you might wear some cowboy hat or something but you've got like a blazer on you don't look like a dirty cowboy yeah because i'm not right you know like even even when i wear the western gear for stage that's kind of a stage stage look um but i like um you know we can get more into this but i just love 80s new wave music Mm -hmm. and like you know even in like what was it early 90s when like bono was sporting like a stetson for a little while there have been these moments where like country and western culture kind of flirts with like 80s kind of club culture yeah so i kind of like um keeping people guessing like even the song that you mentioned pretty good singer it kicks off the album it's very much like a dusty kind of country song Mm -hmm. And then that is, there's maybe one other tune on the album that kind of has that production style, but you know, we're, we're working with very polished pop rock stuff here. Right. And I think Petty's a great mention. I mean, we're always going back to like, you know, what, what would Tom Petty do? And specifically, you know, those records he made with, um, what's the ELO guy? Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn. Thank Mm -hmm. you. My brain is slow this morning. Um, but you know, so, you know, what what Jeff Lynn was always doing, in my opinion, and I'm not, I don't, people can disagree with this, but I think that there was that beautiful moment in the 80s where it was like, because it was the 80s, it was about maximalizing. Everything's maximus or yeah. mac- maximalist, yes, but also minimalist somehow. Yeah, and um, I feel like that's what those guys were always figuring out, like yeah. throwing, you know, throwing everything at the wall, every, you know, the kitchen sink, like everything's going on in this recording. But it's also somehow a minimalist. Yeah, it's in the pocket effect. every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they were also like all of those guys were all master songwriters. Yep, master producers, of master their, performers. In, yeah, in their yeah. own right, mm-hmm. separately, and you got them together, uh, and it's just like, yeah, mind blowing. Um, and yes, I, and I'll stop talking about this, and we'll get into the song, but. <clears throat> That's one of the things I like about your style is that it's not just country pop. So it's a little different. It makes you go like kind of cock your head to the side and listen. Um, I always joke there's something for everyone to get angry about. You know, it's not, yeah, it's not totally country. It's not totally rock. Right. Exactly. You're saying I, I call this the style on this album, I've been calling it new wave Western. Okay. Cause it kind of has like a lot of, you know, elements of new wave music from the eighties, but also with this kind of Western sheen and, um, 
again, I you I don't think that those two genres naturally really gravitate right. towards each other. And it, it is a bold choice in a lot of respects because and and I think in a good way. But I think you're right. Like you're gonna have people that are like, well, this doesn't fit country radio, and this isn't that, and yeah. whatever. And they'd be right. I'm not and, getting played on country radio. <laughs> right. So they'd be, they'd be right. But that doesn't. That's not to say you won't ever, because Perhaps. you know it takes. I say this all the time as well. The the unique artist eventually breaks through, and everyone copies that because everyone who's gotten huge is unique in their own way enough unless they're just a straight up copycat right yeah. coattails on another genre you know johnny cash was unique because of his voice or yeah his songwriting style his limitations were kind of his strength right i think there's a lot to say too i mean how many times has this happened where there's the artist that kind of does their thing but it's like five or six or seven or eight years kind of mm -hmm. ahead of when people are ready for it right and then five or six or seven or eight years later you know, a bunch of other people do it and all of a sudden that becomes the thing. Right. And I'm not I'm not truly saying that I think that is necessarily the case with my music, but um I think you're right. It's it's uh it is it is kind of a different take. And um I always joke like, you know, for folks for folks who came in to my music and heard, you know, Angelino and were kinda of like, Oh, I love the seventies, so this is cool. Mm -hmm. Um and then they just expected me to keep churning out more of that, they're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, I never promised, even by using the phrase SoCal country to describe my earlier music, it was par mostly because the phrase California country was already a thing, right? right. That, that already meant Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't use that. So I said SoCal country instead of California country because I wanted to give a distinction. But part of also saying that was to say, I am just doing my own thing. You know what I mean? I'm doing my own thing. So I, I've told folks, you know, if if you really liked my first album, um, it's always going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. But I can only ever promise you, I'm never, I, I can't promise you I'm always going to make country music. I can only promise you I'm going to make Sam Outlaw records. Right. That's it. Yeah. I'm going to do truly whatever I want to do. And if you like some of it, that's great. And if you don't like some of it, that's to be expected. Right. But God forbid we just keep making sequels to our previous work in hopes that, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, a well, lot, a lot of artists do it. And I think it, it, um, it's a way to go. And, and I, and I've said this before too, if let's say when I put out Angelino in 2015, if that became a huge hit and I had a team of a dozen people that were, there's livelihood were, were based on me continuing to make music that sounded like that. Mm -hmm. I'd have to really think twice about this whole I'm an artist thing and I'll make what I want thing. Right. You know, if you're Alan Jackson in the early 90s and you put out Chattahoochee, your next song is going to sound like Chattahoochee because you made yeah. a scrillion dollars on it and, <laughs> and you're touring big and everyone's making a bunch of money now. So I'm lucky in a sense that that did not happen to me. I did not right. become an overnight sensation where now everyone's, you know, uh, or where my livelihood and the millions of dollars and the buses and the big house and is all dependent on me continuing to just make a sequel to the big hit. Right. So I'm lucky that I just simply have not been successful enough to warrant needing to regurgitate old material. Yeah, well, that's a um, that's probably an unpopular thing to say. Perhaps in this world. Yeah, perhaps <laughs> uh, most people want to would say that they're unlucky not to have that break or whatever that is but i'm with you i agree i think that um it takes a lot of maturity to get to that point and it takes a lot of um real realization that you can be content making what you want to make yeah and i get to keep failing you know i feel like i was kind of barely figuring out how to do the kind of country music i wanted to make in 2014 when I got to make that record with Ry Cooter. And then um, almost the moment I was starting to learn how to do that, I started getting getting interested in making other sounds. So a lot of the new wave Western kind of sound that started on this album, Popular Mechanics, I hear how much better I got at it on Terracotta, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm noticing, I'm observing me and my people trying to hone in on this sound. You know, you get some sound in your head it's like, I want this to kind of sound like Alan Jackson meets New Order. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, that's, what does that mean? What yeah. you, and then I hear myself trying to do it. And, you know, all you can do is try. 
but you can get closer. Right. You can get closer unless you're worried about, will people like this? Will this get played? Will this get heard? Will this get liked? I think that if you're worried about that, I'm not saying there's not still a great way to make good music with that being a concern, but I'm just lucky to not be shackled by that. Yeah. Great points. Okay. Someone quite like you. Um, why don't you tell us where this song came from? Um, did you co-write this? Was this by yourself or how did it kind of formulate? Yeah. Um, I, I just feel like the song just totally announced itself and sort of materialized out of thin air. Um, I am not a disciplined songwriter. I don't sit down at the same time every day to, to write music. I basically just lazily rely upon the bolt of lightning sort of style of writing music. So, um, I think, um, so first of all, not only do I love new wave music, but I really love boy band music. Um, so like, um, BB Mac, that song from the nineties back here, baby, or, um, I'd been listening to the song by Backstreet Boys, um, shape of my heart a lot. And there's just these big, big hooks, obviously that, that music was all about, we got to, every recording is going to cost a lot of money. It's going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they had really good songwriters. And um, I also kind of think there was this fun, kind of this fun trend in the middle and late 90s of like um, artists like Madonna making albums where like the lyrics almost sound like they were written by someone where English is their second language, where it's like not super like specific, but it's a little more like kind of generic mm -hmm. lyric writing. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty sure I was just, I just had my guitar. I was in, I go into the master bathroom of my house because there's like a teeny bit of reverb in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just, plugging around on the guitar. I think I was probably rehearsing for a show and um the hook the like it just popped into my head. It's yeah. the simplest way to put it is that that popped into my head. And then um and then yeah, uh I think the first lyrics that came in is um you know, it's like when I'm like you, you know, ending a phrase with the word you or me, those yeah. are the two most common, right? Cause you right. can rhyme a million things with you and it can mean anything. You can get there in any way and you can rhyme a million things with me and you can get there anyway, any, in any route. So I think someone quite like you, that little, uh, that, that came first. And then I think though, the and uh, nah, 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 kind of the build up to it just popped into my head. Yeah. So it was definitely one of those situations where I knew it was just kind of like a boy band style pop song. I also, again, I am not trying to make esoteric highbrow art. I'm just not. Yeah. <laughs> That's just never been my thing. That's not really the kind of music I like. Um, sometimes, maybe sometimes it is, but I'm not listening to a lot of like Leonard Cohen. You right. Know what I mean, yeah. And so like when I, when I hear this hook to me, it just sounds kind of like boy band music. It and does. You, I didn't think about that until you just said it. Yeah. That's You're because right. we put kind of this Tom Petty. I mean, and truly, if you listen to um, learning to fly, um, it's in many ways, like with all the BGVs that they layer in and all the stuff going on, it's very much like a nineties boy band song mm -hmm. because in a boy band, you have boys, you've got four or five dudes. Yeah. So you've got all of these people singing. So you'll hear in the track for someone quite like you, there's just a tremendous amount of vocals. And even when we play this song live, it's like, you got to be careful how you do it. Cause even as I was recording it, I was like, well, which part is the main vocal? Right. That, it took us a second to figure that out. Yeah. But I think the song just materialized. I probably wrote the whole damn thing in 10 minutes. I think it's technically a co-write with Cheyenne because I, I employed his help to help me sort of tighten up some of the lyrics. Right to zero in on the arrangement. So I'm pretty sure Cheyenne has a co-write on this. I'd have to check the back of the... Which is a good little um, sidestep uh, on talking about songwriting real fast is uh, as a writer being big enough or small enough, whatever mm -hmm. way that goes, and saying, hey, can you check this out and see if if this is... this Could, it, could this be better... Is there anything that needs fixing? Yeah. Does it need to tighten up? Is yeah. this too wordy? Yep. Does it make sense? Yep. That is showing your maturity as a songwriter. Bring it to another writer and they'll, you know, that's happened to me kind of on the fly in the studio before yeah. where the producer's like, hey, let's uh, let's change this. It what about this? Really, yeah. yeah. That's happened to me too. But yeah, look, first of all, Cheyenne is a really good writer. Mm -hmm. Like if you go on Spotify and check out his song, like Crane Fly, 
that's just a really creative, cool tune yeah. with a ton of heart. Mm -hmm. And he comes at this like concept about his partner in a way that you're just not expecting, you right. know? So first of all, I didn't just ask anybody <laughs> to give right. me input. That said, you'll probably do better in art if you are willing to collaborate a little. I'm not looking for a committee to tell me what they think sure. about my song, but Shan's a sensitive um, cr creative artist, creative thinker. So I doubt that he came in and was like red inking a lot of the lines. Right. But yeah, he's he's great at being like, you know, maybe it's this instead of this. Maybe. Yeah. This. And um, so to your point, I just very much agree with you. I do think that since I was a 16 year old writing my own stuff to now, I hope to God I've grown in maturity a little oh, bit. Oh, of course. And have. certainly enough to be able to say, you know what? I bet if I bring this to this other super talented songwriter, I bet it could be better. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take a second and listen to the work tape. Um, I like this work tape also because um, this one was, you just straight up put it on your phone. Yep. Uh, would you have done this the day you wrote it? Um, it might have been within days of writing yeah. it. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some, uh, probably the like I could go through my phone. I'm sure the first demos are me just singing the chorus. Right. Um, but pretty much right away, the verse melodies popped in. I think I had most of the lyrics and it was Cheyenne. We ended up not using this, but you can hear on the work tape, Cheyenne's kind of intro, the bump, 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 right. okay. bump, bump. Yeah. We ended up not using it, but it was a really cool, I, I really liked the idea as mm -hmm. a way to start the song. Cool. Well, let's check that out and we'll come back and uh, get into some lyrics. One. Like I said, I like this work tape. I love that Cheyenne's on it. I didn't know that when I heard it. Yep. Um, I feel like I can hear his vocal on the recording, like on the record. Oh I yeah. Like I can, yeah, his BGVs are all over. Pinpoint him yeah, in yeah. there. Um, but yeah. So lyrically, what is this song about? 
I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. I think. Yeah. Um, was it, is this more like a storytelling song for you or is it definitely not a storytelling? It's just me. Basically the idea is I'm, I'm always the source of my own problems. Mm -hmm. Like always 100% of the time I've learned this. The problem is me. It's not other. It's not other people. You know, if ninety five percent of the world could figure that out, we'd be all right. I think perhaps, but <laughs> just for right now, I've got my hands full with just me figuring that out. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the lyric I got in in my own way again, and part of the idea too is like when you start the phrase with "I got in." And then in my own way, again, it starts off like positive and then quickly turns to right. negative, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit of a little trickery there. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's me thinking about my partner, uh, my wife, Andy. It's me, you know, I've got a lot of love songs. It's funny because I don't see myself as like an optimistic person, but I totally am. Like in some ways I'm cynical, but I'm very much like a like, kind of a lovey-dovey romantic, yeah. you know? So I think this song is just me musing upon that. It's me thinking about my partner and how um, how really lucky I am, how grateful I am to have this person that like loves me and sticks with me. So um, for folks who find that to be a disgusting thing to write about, I completely understand and I completely relate. But unfortunately, I'm one of those like in love kind of dumb dudes who's just kind of like hap happily married yeah and so that's i think just what i was thinking about as i was going and you know the 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 chorus um i've never known someone quite like you um uh i know that's like kind of like a no duh kind of uh concept but it just felt like the right sentiment for this sort of happy boy band yeah but also there's minor key and stuff in there so it's got that right. little tinge of sadness to you yeah and also everyone on the planet is totally unique. Like someone can like remind you of someone else, but when you know somebody, that's right. Like your wife, that's a different knowing. Yeah. And you can't know someone like that yeah. again. You, you, you may know someone like that again in the respects that you know them. Yeah. That deeply, but, yeah. uh, not that person. I know. Isn't that crazy? Like we're, I mean, we get teased as millennials. We get teased about being snowflakes because yeah. we're, we always want to point out that we're all different and we're all special and all unique. But annoyingly, that is also true. It is true. It is true. I think, yeah, we get teased about it because we point it out. I think that's it. It's like, just leave it alone and just let it be. Just let it go. <laughs> it doesn't need to be said. Yeah. yeah we'll talk about our feelings it's all the been time. It's said. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. Is there anything else you want to say about the song and the writing process or? You know, it, like, I think most of the songs of mine that I like the most. They just happen very quickly. Yeah, I don't really work that hard for them. Like, um, I, I let the song just sort of exist. In fact, one of the reasons I bring in someone like Cheyenne is to double check my work on lyrics because I like melodies so much that often, kind of my defect as a songwriter is that I will sacrifice putting in thoughtful lyrics because I just want to get the damn thing over with so I can record a catchy mm. melody, mm -hmm. like a hook. Um, but I, I do think there's a lot to say for like, I don't listen to music and go, are these lyrics smart enough? And now I like it. Right. I just like it because I like it. Like there's that really great um, YouTube channel, the Rick Beato thing. What makes this song great? Mm -hmm. And really that show could just be called, Things Rick Beato notices about this song. Right. We don't know what makes a song great. There's no way to know that. It just either has the thing or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came up with the hook for this song, I was like, this has it. This has the thing. This is catchy. This has the vibe of the music I want to make. And at this point, too, I'm thankful for any kind of big pop song that can be a vehicle for making that kind of music. I very much like that maximalist 80s thing you know the right. phil collins mike and the mechanics um as you mentioned tom petty there was a lot of just awesome swagger happening in the studios yeah in that early to mid to late 80s time and um so any song where i'm like ooh, this is a chance to kind of do that that's very exciting yeah do you like to write i do like to write i i heard someone say the other day on a podcast this is a great sentiment um I was listening to that that showrunner and TV creator Bill Lawrence, who who made Spin City, yeah, and he made like a Ted Lasso, and he said, 
he corrected himself. He said, I don't like to write. I like to have written something. Okay. And I would say I could, I could certainly yeah. con- connect with that sentiment. Yeah. In the middle of it, it does seem like work, sort of. I like to have written something. Yeah. And I also certainly like to have recorded and made something. Right. So this morning in preparation of coming over here to talk with you, I did my run at Shelby Park and I popped on my headphones and I listened to this song, um, you know, five times. Right. And I thought to myself, damn, we did it. This yeah. is a beautiful song. And mostly I genuinely mean like Cheyenne and, and the band that I hired, Brian Cox on drums, um, Michael Dutton on the guitar, um, Cheyenne was on bass and playing a bunch of other things in the recording, um, Jeremy Long on keys. But I, I, I hear this and I go, you know, usually when I make a record, you listen to the songs, you're like, okay, most of these were in like the 90 percent ish, where like we made it to like 90 or 95 percent of that thing in my head. And with this song, it's darn close to 100. Yeah. It's darn close. You're like, this is about as good as I can make this song. Yeah. So it's a it's a proud moment. That's awesome. I love hearing that. Um, last question, and then I'll let you go. Um, oh, I've I've just one other thing oh, to go say. Ahead. Yeah. The intro, which we got rid of the bump 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 we had also recorded going back to that for the bridge we had kind of an instrumental bridge before the down verse yeah and we cut all that i'll also say too i normally like to put a vocal bridge in a song and i wrote one for this song which i actually think is decent yeah but the song just felt like a song where it doesn't have a bridge yeah you want to get back to that hook because yep. the chorus is so catchy. Yeah. So it's like, I want to triple down on that chorus. Yeah. So some so going back to the thing of like not needing a song to be smart to like it, sometimes it's like, that is the song, man. The song doesn't need the damn bridge. Yeah. You don't need to make it more of a song. It's I always say that for the most part, I'm just writing like a 20 second jingle. And then we have to find a way to stretch that jingle into a two to three minute song. God forbid I have a song that's much over three minutes. You know, what, that's a really good uh, point of view. What kind of mess am, have I got myself in if my songs are going over three minutes? Yeah. You know, I'm not Mozart. <laughs> so with with this song, it was it really was. I mean, I know there's that kind of cliche of uh, "Don't bore us, get to the chorus" uh-huh. kind of thing. But um, yeah, this was one of those things. I can still remember the hook for the bridge, and it's a, it rocks. It was yeah. cool. But this was just one of those occasions where I was like, no. Don't do the bridge. Just keep like triple down on the chorus. Yeah. So maybe you could take the bridge and just make it another song. I could. Or sometimes, you know, I've been tempted to release like alternate versions. And you know something we should give your listeners? There's an incredible, before we brought in the saxophone, which this guy, Tyler Summers, recorded. I mean, we were just going to have sax, I think, on the outro of the song. Mm -hmm. But then he kept sending us takes where he's just playing through the whole thing, because why not? Yeah. And so we heard his solo and instrumental. There used to be, I can give you the version of Cheyenne playing this shredding guitar solo. And it was a really hard decision to go from the guitar solo to the sax solo. But Cheyenne's it, a great guitar. Incredible. So. He's incredible. And and um and it was also just full of energy. But then when we heard what happened with the saxophone on this song, where he kind of peeks in in the intro yeah. and then he disappears and he comes back in the pre-chorus, the second the second pre-chorus, and then he's in the chorus, and then he has his um uh, instrumental. It was so exciting and had such a a vibe that all of a sudden now we've got a saxophone song. Right. You know? So, yeah. but I, I would love to give your listeners a peek at what the instrumental sounded like when it was a guitar solo. Yeah. So you can hear the. Yeah, we'll do it. Cool. We'll do it for sure. Um, also, two quick things. I just noticed, because I'm sitting here at the vinyl, that you worked with Smith Curry on this. Yeah, Smith Curry, the great Smith Curry. I've worked with Smith. He's a Dobro and Pedal Steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marley, uh, sorry, Marley. Molly Pardon is on this. Oh, she's one of my best friends. Longtime collaborator, Molly Pardon. That's cool. She's done some work with my best friend, Micah Talks. Oh, yeah. Um, Micah Talks, dude. He's a superstar. Yeah. I hope I get to work with him someday. You totally should. It would be... I would love to hear you with him, actually. I would love to also. That's interesting. I think I got got his number. That'd be cool. I'll give it to you if you don't. Um, And then, last question. I was going to ask you if... Okay. You have to choose one record that you can listen to for the first time again. Oh, my God. As if you've never heard it. Is it weird that I have an answer right now? It can't be your own. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Can you imagine if I picked it? It would be the Sam Outlaw album (laughs) that I just put out. 
you know, it would be off the, right now. My first reaction when you said that is the um, Radiohead's second album, The Bends. Mm, that's a I, great choice. Because I was, I remember we were on a family road trip and we stopped in some town on the way wherever we were going. We used to take these road trips to South Dakota because that's where all my extended family is. So we're in probably kind of like somewhere. And I stopped at like a Sam Goody's and I'm, you know, leafing through the CDs. And I, I'd already had, I'd already had Radiohead. Um, okay computer because that was like the big album from 97 98 but i didn't have the one before it and so i see this weird cover but it says radiohead and there was like a little like they would for marketing they would put like a little tab of paper over the actual album cover and it said like rolling stone five stars yeah and i thought wow rolling stone gave this album five stars it must be like a perfect album Mm -hmm. and it is is. (laughs) so i remember getting that cd again a few years after it came out after after OK Computer had already come out and putting that on my disc man when I got into the car and putting that on and first song oh man that dun, first dun, song dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah um my god yeah my god even now when I I like to bump those songs because I want to remember what guitars are supposed to sound like and oh, just like man. geez I mean Whew. So yeah. if I, but you know what, how badly do I also wish I could just go back to being 15 mm-hmm. and just hearing anything again with those years. There's something spo- so special that's happening when you're that age and listener, you're never going to get it back. You yeah. can't get it back. So when you're that age, you better hope to God that you've got some good inputs. And we came up in, in a special, I feel like a pretty special time in music where it's not like music before our generation didn't sound good, but something was being honed in right there in the mid to late nineties. It was it, still analog and digital was coming in and when everything you, was when just you like, look at the variety of music that was considered quote alt rock that was yes. being played on the radio. It is bonkers. Yeah. I mean, bonkers. Yeah. Everything. I mean, even I, I hate to say I was at a wedding this weekend. I heard some real bad, like one hit wonder kind of stuff like um, <laughs> Cotton Eye Joe. Yeah. And truly, though, even that recording is kind of incredible. Right. So, yeah, I feel incredibly lucky to have grown up when I did. Because obviously in the 90s, you can still listen to music from the 70s. You still listen right. to music in the 80s. But, you know, I remember like for me, like, you know, my learner's permit is like associated with Matchbox 20. And I actually didn't even really like Rob Thomas's voice in the 90s. Weirdly, now when I hear it again, I really like it. Yeah. There's so much about that music. I probably like it even way more now than I did back then. It's interesting how that happens. I mean, Goo Goo Dolls' Iris was the second most played song on the radio in 1998, second behind Celine Dion, My Heart Will Go, Do- Go that On. That dude could write some songs. Incredible. I yeah. saw Goo Goo Dolls in Franklin at that new amphitheater they've got. Yeah. I think it's Franklin. Uh, this was like maybe six months ago, or maybe it was a year ago, my God, because it was hot. And the band was incredible. His voice was incredible. Wow. And those songs are just as good as they've ever been. Yeah. In fact, makes me want to go home right now and write a Goo Goo Dolls song because yeah. those things are so good. But yeah, I think that if I had to pick, it's I can never do this, but it, <laughs> it might be the Benz. Mine was okay. Somebody asked me that question, and mine was OK Computer. No way. So we yeah. both picked Radiohead. We both did. Like right off the bat, too. Yeah, those two albums, I mean... <sighs> What can be said about, you know, I have nothing to contribute other than just me, uh, just a long We could do a, an entire podcast series on. Spend the rest, you could spend the rest records. of your life chatting with folks about how just those two albums have impacted their life and careers. Yeah. And yeah, 100%. my God. Well, Sam Outlaw, thanks for being here. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to say again for this song we're listening to, um, that sax player, Tyler Summers. Yeah. My God. And it is Tyler, not Taylor, right? Can you check the back of the... I'm so paranoid in this moment. Let me see, Sax. Tyler. Good, Tyler. Okay. Yeah. Um, that dude lives right here in Nashville, and he is a beast. Like, again, I can't I can't be clear enough about this. Like, the song was not a sax song, and then we hired that guy, and it just, like, really, really blossomed with yeah. him on it. And um, all, all of the good stuff that I get to do... Be, because of the privilege of making music has been because I get to work with great people. Yeah. 
So we talked about Cheyenne, but again, Brian Cox on drums, Jeremy Long, who's my been my long term, uh, long time pedal steel player. He plays a great pedal steel, a great six string, a great keyboard, great synthesizer. He's a superstar. Um, Michael Dunton. Uh, it was made in Studio Punch Up, uh, which is Andy Freeman's studio here in okay. town. He's an incredible engineer. Yeah. Um, and again, Cheyenne's all over it. BGVs, bass, probably a bunch of guitar. Like, what a dream team. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. It's and a great album. It's it's a beautiful album, and I'm I'm insanely proud of it. And thanks for giving me a chance to brag about it. Oh, thanks for coming and talking. It's so great. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Cool, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. When we're gone, what will be left behind? Beside trust funds or coin collections, we live on through our stories, the legends and legacies that tell of our greatest successes, our wildest ideas, our biggest failures. And what better vehicle for a story than music? Our musical heritage holds many truths about our humanity and perhaps even more mysteries. I mean, my, my whole thing here is basically a theory. There's nothing here that I can prove or disprove. Join me in my quest for answers as I explore untold stories. You know, breathe a little bit of life back in a dial song. That's, that's my contribution to the band. Go on unforeseen adventures. We are getting in Unit 92. My son, Walker, this one's for you. This is Will's handwriting. Dive deep into conversations with some household names. Hey, this is Amy Grant. Hey, everybody, it's Vince Gill. Hello, this is Ben Folds. And peer into dusty corners of the internet. I am in full belief that Pink Floyd intentionally wrote their album, Dark Side of the Moon, to line up with The Wizard of Oz. Hear from those whose hearts define what it means to be human. That music, it don't discriminate. It's one of the things I know that bring people together. If you put a smile on a kid's face, then you've done a day's work. And those who knew the stakes of their calling. My first thought was, oh, this is 50 grand. This is worth 50 grand. And they heard me sing. And they said, well, wait a minute. We're getting ready to do this Scooby-Doo thing. Get him. Join the journey as I see how far my questions can get me. What is the power that music holds to do this kind of thing? It's like a scientist. like, I don't really know why this works all the time, but every time I do it, it works. But when we search for answers, we rarely find the ones we expect. And sometimes, we realize that we don't need an answer at all. From Wise Company Productions, I'm Jonas Litton, and this is Stories and Sounds. Available wherever you listen to your favorite sounds.